Hello. This video is on the chi-squared test of independence. As you can see in the syllabus, much of the calculation will be done on our calculator. To remind you of the steps of a hypothesis test, the first step is to state the null and alternative hypotheses. The second step is to calculate the expected frequencies. The third step is to state the significance level. Well, actually, it'll be given in the question. And then to calculate the number of degrees of freedom. The fourth step is to calculate the value of the test statistic and the p-value. Okay, and that's what we'll do on our calculator. The fifth step is to state the acceptance and rejection criteria and again any critical value used will be given in the question and finally step six is to draw our conclusion. To draw our conclusion we either use the test value, the test statistic or the p-value. So the chi-squared test for independence is used to test whether the two variables are independent of each other or not. And the null hypothesis will be that the two variables are independent. And therefore the alternative hypothesis will be that the two variables are not independent. And those always remain the same for, for a test of independence. For example, we might perform a test to find out whether the variables gender and regular exercise in adults are related. And we would therefore write the null hypothesis that regular exercise in adults is independent of gender. And the alternative hypothesis would be that regular exercise in adults is not independent of gender. To carry out a chi-square test for independence, the observed frequencies need to be recorded in a, in a two-way table called a contingency table. And the example on the right shows you a two by two contingency table because it has two rows for the gender, male and female, and two columns, okay, one for regular exercise and one for no regular exercise. And the aim of the test is to try to find out whether the data collected will support the null hypothesis. The table of collected data is called the observed frequencies. The expected frequencies are calculated using the probability rule for ind independent events. So the probability of an adult being both male and performing uh, regular exercise is found by multiplying the two separate probabilities together. So for male that's 216 males out of 400. And for regular exercises, that's uh, 208 out of 400. Okay, so you can see the calculation here. And then to find the expected number of uh, male adults taking regular exercise, we multiply that probability by 400, the number of trials. And in fact, we can cancel down one of those 400s so we're just left with 216, which is the uh, row total, multiplied by 208, which is the column total, divided by 400, which is the grand total. And you can see all the other calculations shown here. Each probability found by multiplying a row total by a column total and divided by a grand total. The number of degrees of freedom is given by this formula here, or this calculation here, and it's uh, rows minus one multiplied by columns minus one. So in this example, there are two rows and two columns. Okay, so it, the calculation is two minus one, which is one, multiplied by two minus one, which is one, and one times one is one, so the degrees of freedom is equal to one. 
And what this means is that once you've calculated um, one of your expected frequencies, for example, the number of adults who are both male and taking regular exercise, 112 there, the other, the other numbers are not free to vary because they're constrained to give the totals. So this number has to be 104 to give a total of 216. This number has to be 96 to give a total of 208. And this number has to be 88 to give the totals of 192 and 184. Hence, there is only one degree of freedom for a two by two contingency table. The significance level that this determines the threshold for us making the decision. In other words, along with the uh, number of degrees of freedom, it will set the critical value. Well, you will be told what level of significance to use in the question, and it'll either be 1, 5, or 10%. On to the test statistic. Now, I've included the formula here, but actually, you don't need to use the formula because we're going to calculate the test statistic on our calculator. I've included it here just in case you choose to do a chi-squared test in your internal assessment. So much of the chi-squared test is done on your calculator. So first we need to input the observed frequencies into your calculator as a matrix. And I'll show you how to do that now. So we start by pressing mate, um, 1 on your calculator, run matrix. So go to menu and select option 1. And then we'll press F3 to go to a matrix. Now if your matrix has the wrong dimensions, you see it's 2 by 4 here, and uh, we need a 2 by 2 for the example, we need to dimension the matrix A. So I press F3 again where it says dim, F3, and uh, the cursor down, and I change that to a 2 by 2 and press enter, press enter again. And now we're able to enter the information of the observed frequencies. So we have a 110, 106, 98, 86. When we perform a chi-squared test on our calculator, the expected frequencies will be automatically created and saved in matrix B. So let's go ahead and do that now. So on our calculator, we press menu and option 2 for statistics. And then we want to do a chi-squared test, so that's F3 for tests. Chi-squared test is F3 again. And we're doing a what's called a two-way table test or a contingency table test. So we press two-way F2. Okay, and yes, we've already put our observed frequencies in matrix A, so we're ready to execute. So we can scroll down to execute and press execute. If you'd like to see the expected frequencies, we can see those by pressing F6, the matrix option. Scrolling down to choose matrix B, and pressing enter, and there you can see the expected frequencies. As shown below. So to go back, we can just press exit, and exit again, and we're back at our summary screen for our test. So you can see that the test statistic is 0 0.217, and the corresponding p-value is 0 0.641. And it also tells you the degrees of freedom is 1. So on to the acceptance-rejection criteria. There's one of two ways that we make a conclusion. We either compare the uh, p-value to the significance level, or we compare the test statistic to the critical value, if it's given in the question. And if the p-value is less than the significance level, 
then there is sufficient evidence to reject the null hypothesis. Similarly, if the test statistic is greater than the critical value, there's sufficient evidence to reject the null hypothesis. If the conclusion is not to reject the null hypothesis, then we write that there is sufficient evidence at that level of significance to suggest that the two variables are independent. If the conclusion is to reject the null hypothesis, then we say that there is sufficient evidence at that significance level, significance level to suggest the two variables are not independent. So in the example we've done, we had a p-value of 0.641. If we're testing at the 5% level, which is 0.05, we can see that 0.641 is indeed greater than 0.05. In other words, the p-value is greater than the significance level, so we're going to accept the null hypothesis and say that there is sufficient evidence at the 5% level to suggest that regular exercise in adults is independent of gender.